So today we're very excited to have uh, Associate Professor Stefania Dombrava. I hope I'm pronouncing your surname correctly. Is that the correct pronunciation? Yeah, Stefania Dombrava. Uh, it's a Romanian name, so a bit hard to pronounce, but uh, very good. Too. Okay, all right, perfect. So let me just go ahead and introduce you. So she is an associate professor at the NC Engineering School in Paris and a permanent researcher at the Samovar Laboratory of the Polytechnic Institute of Paris. And she was previously a postdoctoral researcher in the India team Celtic at uh, IRISA in Rennes and in the database team at LIRIS, University of Lyon 1 in Lyon. She also holds a PhD in computer science from the Paris Sackley University on the formal verification of database engines, as well as an MSc in computer science and a BSc in mathematics from Jacobs University, Bremen, Germany. She also has worked at India Sophia Antipolis at the German Institute for Artificial Intelligence, DFKI, and at the Max Planck Institute for Computer Science. She currently works on practical applications of formal methods to data management and program analysis. We are extremely excited to have you with us, ma'am. Uh, is there anything you'd like to say before we get into the questions? I'm very excited and flattered to, to be invited. And uh, I'm very happy to see so many people connected. So I hope this will be a useful session for, for everyone. Yeah. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. All right. So my first question to you is, what is your background? And uh, what subjects did you take up in your schooling, graduation, further studies? And I think you've done your graduation from Germany and then, you know, your PhD uh, from uh, Paris. So how is that? What's, what, what, how were the subjects that you took up? So I'm actually going to start with my high school. I'm going to go all the way back to, to my high school years. So I come from Romania, from uh, Yash, which is, uh, you know, like a cultural capital of Romania, the fourth biggest city. But we have a very uh, strong university tradition there because the first Romanian university uh, was founded in my hometown. So we're like, a, you know, university city. And I was exposed to, to this uh, culture early on. And in high school, actually, I was uh, studying a lot of uh, mathematics and physics. I went to contests, to Olympiads. Back in those days, it was quite rare to have access to computer science classes at the high school level. But I was one of the few lucky ones to actually be able to benefit from these classes from my high school, that excellent high school, uh, Rakovica National College in Yash. And uh, after these uh, high school studies, so in my senior year, I already knew that I wanted to study abroad uh, to, to deepen um, my knowledge of mathematics and maybe see if there are some other areas that I could explore. But in that, uh, at that time in 2007, Romania was not part of the European Union. And it was very hard to go, for example, to the US or even to other countries in Europe because we were still regarded as uh, international students. So I got a scholarship from Jacobs University in Bremen, which was founded as a, a research university, a private research university, originally a, a branch of Rice University in Bremen. And what was so amazing about that place is that I had a lot of friends from a mathematical contests that actually were going with me to, to study there. And really the accent was on research. So from very early on, for my first year, actually, I was able to, to, to engage with research group um, in, on campus, which was really quite unique. And I had the opportunity to do research internships. So I, I started very early on. So like I said, I got the scholarship uh, in Bremen. So I moved to Germany, I was 18, so in 2007, yeah. And uh, my bachelor degree was in mathematics. But like I said, early on, uh, I, so I had to study, uh, you know, like I had to take courses in various areas, not only in mathematics. So in particular, I took an introductory computer science course where I was absolutely fascinated uh, by logics and its applications to computer science. And there was a professor, so the professor teaching the course that had uh, actually uh, a research group called Quark on knowledge representation and information management. And he was actually studying uh, formal methods and how uh, we can you know, uh, reason mathematically about different programs. 
So I started joining that research group, and the more I was exposed to, you know, to to, to seminars and uh, and uh, you know gra even graduate classes in the topic, I realized that I actually wanted to shift from mathematics to computer science, which is um, something I did uh, during my master studies. And um, during my master studies, uh, I was mostly doing computational logics because it was uh, what drew me to this field. But I also took a lot of classes in machine learning. It was my my minor, so to say, but also robotics, uh, you know, statistics, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, very different classes. Yeah. But then in my second year, uh, uh, my master's thesis was actually on, on type theory and, uh, you know, uh, very, um, the fundamentals of programming languages. And at that point, even though the topic was, uh, was very interesting and I had a lot of fun working on my master's thesis, I realized that I would actually want to do something that is uh, more applied. So then I was thinking, okay, where could I go to still work in this area, so in formal methods and logics and things that I had grown to love, but with, a, with more focus on the applicative side. So then my attention to, to, turned towards France, where I had done a research internship at INRIA in Nice, with a team that was working on actually proving with the computer a uh, very important theorem in mathematics related to, to the classification of finite groups. And that was, uh, you know, a, a huge effort spanning, you know, ten years and a research team of, uh, you know, dozens of, of researchers. And I had the opportunity to, to to be an intern while they were developing this proof. So it was like a, a, a formalization, a mechanization with a theorem prover of a proof that is more than three thousand pages. Yeah, and people didn't know if this proof had any bugs. So to be able to say for sure that the proof was correct, they were actually doing it with the uh, with the computer, with the system. So that was very, very nice, but I still wanted to go one level further and see, okay, uh, can these techniques uh, be actually applied not only to, to mathematics to be, to, to be sure that pen and paper proofs are correct, but can they be applied to software systems at large? So then I found, uh, I was doing a lot of research on, on PhD topics that were actually trying to tackle this issue. And I found uh, exactly what I was looking for. So my I had two PhDs advisors that had this idea that we could actually use uh, theorem provers to develop, uh, you know, um, uh, correct by construction database engines. So that that's how, uh, uh, you know, like I, I got uh, I got the topic. I uh, I contacted them. There was a competition. I got the national French scholarship for for doing uh, for doing research. They they supported my PhD entirely for for three years. And yeah, so that's basically the story. And so th just as a summary, well, most of my background was from mathematics, uh, theoretical computer science, and towards my PhD, I started studying databases. Yeah. Okay. I, I hope <laughs> I hope I didn't uh, you know miss anything. And uh, oh no, so that please. Was wonderful. You know. It was amazing. Thank you so much for telling us. And this just goes to prove that um, you know, like you started out with mathematics, and then you. I realized that you know CS or computer science is what you wanted to do. Mm. Similarly, it's not necessary that you need to decide at the very beginning this is what you want to do. You can decide it later and still manage to work it out. Yes, because at that age, you know, even at 18, you don't have really the maturity to to make a choice that would impact the rest of your life. And also our preferences evolve. Okay. So as we are exposed to, to different classes and even to, to different types of professors, because oftentimes your your you know um, the way in which you perceive a topic is deeply influenced by the personality of the professor teaching it. Yeah. So I, I can say that because this professor that taught my introductory computer science class, Professor Kohase, was so charismatic and I loved so much the way in which you're presenting things and you know, like the vision that he had. It was completely, you know, uh, life changing for me, and I knew from that point onwards that this is what I want to do. So, okay. Whereas, okay, I had other professors that were very, very good, but I don't know, they didn't engage me as much. So, in this case, it was, you know, it was the professor also that that helped do this shift. Yeah. Absolutely, of course. 
and you know that's that's what uh, college is about getting more exposure understanding more things and then you know making better choices yeah definitely definitely okay so my next question to you is how did you decide that you know studying computer science is the right choice i mean you partly already answered it but you know is there anything else you'd like to elaborate on mm Yes, well, I, I think it was. Uh, I think in the beginning, I, I was a bit, uh, you know, I was a bit scared uh, to go into computer science because I, I started off as a math student, and even though I had taken CS classes when I was in high school, you know, like in my bachelor studies, I actually didn't take any software engineering classes. So all the computer classes that I took were, you know, like introductory, where we were doing functional programming, uh, but really, you know, like nothing, uh, no large scale programming projects, right? So then when I did the shift towards my, like in, in my master's studies, I was very frightened. Would I be able to manage it? And actually it was quite hard, okay, because, uh, Honestly, you know, it's good to have a math background, but uh, software engineering requires also different types of, of skills. So at that point, I was quite reluctant. I was thinking, okay, can I make it? Was this a good choice? Uh, but then I, I stuck with it because I found this niche, right? I found this niche where I was able actually to do mathematical proofs, okay, and, uh, and program them. So it's a field called proof engineering, where you actually, you know, like the entire process of constructing a proof is seen from more like from an engineering standpoint because you actually have to do it inside the computer. So yeah, when I realized that it was doable and that I could find this niche and be comfortable with it, then I embraced it because I was very aware of the fact that, uh, you know, like uh, the more theoretical my studies were, the harder later on it would be maybe to integrate the job market, okay? We can discuss this. Now I know that it's a myth. So now I know that, okay, it was not really, the case, but back then that was my line of reasoning. So I wanted to do something that would help me find a job. Right, that makes sense. all right. My next question to you is: So you're an associate professor of computer science at NC Engineering at the School of NC Engineering. So hmm. that's that's amazing. What is how has your experience been? You know, teaching students. Yes. Well, um, maybe I can explain a bit the system in France. I'm not sure how many of you are aware how, how it's happening. So um, you start your PhD studies, right? And then during your PhD, you have two options. So either you focus entirely on your research, or you can actually do some classes on the side. And uh, I was in the latter case. So I started uh, teaching from my PhD um, period. So I had the classes in uh, databases, uh, in logics, even classes related to my field of research, where I would just, you know, supervise the practicals or the theoretical sessions. So I was not really giving the class in the amphitheater, but I was helping students with their exercises. And uh, so that was a very good preparation, yeah? Because actually from my second year of PhD, right until the moment where I got hired, I was teaching every year, right? So here you have access to that. So I was gradually prepared for, for this experience. It didn't take me by surprise, but of course it's totally different when you're a professor, which is something maybe I didn't integrate uh, early on, but you have to prepare all the material, right? You have to prepare the course, you have to prepare the exercise sheets, you have to grade everything and you have to adapt. You have to adapt the material depending on how the students are uh, digesting it because it varies from year to year. So it's a lot more responsibility, not only from a pedagogical point of view, but also from an admin point of view. You have a lot more work. So this is something I had to get used to when I got the job, but the actual experience of engaging with students I acquired from when I was a PhD student, yeah? And, and I started doing it. All right, that is wonderful. My next question to you is, how do you think STEM will progress in the coming years? Yes, this is a very interesting question. Um, so, okay, I think there are two components here. So I think, you know, we're going to experience a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of progress in different areas. 
Uh, of course, you know, AI and robotics will, will be more and more important. Uh, big data analytics, because now we have huge amounts of data. We're producing, you know, like terabytes of information every second. And we actually need the means to analyze and process all these, uh, all this data. And we're, we're doing a lot of progress at the moment, but I think it will be even more so the case in the future. Yeah, I think uh, cross-disciplinary research will, will be more um, pervasive. Uh, here I'm thinking about bioinformatics informatics, but not only that. Um, I also think, okay, and this is more related to my field of, uh, of research, that cybersecurity will, um, you know, will be uh, much more pervasive because, you know, um, I work in formal methods. And when we're trying to, to explain why formal methods are important, we always give these, uh, you know, like these very extreme safety critical examples. For example, you know, there was a, you know, a space station that blew up because of an overflow uh, computation error. Uh, and, uh, and this is like what we're telling people that when we have these very expensive projects or, you know, uh, when we're thinking about transportation, and the software is completely automatic, then we need to have very strong guarantees that algorithms will perform like they're expected to, yeah? And this was, you know, like maybe science fiction uh, decades, decades ago, but now it's becoming more and more a reality. For example, in Paris, we have like two metro lines that have no conductor. They're completely automatic, yeah? So of course you want to be sure that you know the the metro stops when it's supposed to. That uh, the speed limit is uh, is um, you know respected, and this will evolve even more in the coming years. So we're going to have, uh, for example, you know we already saw examples with cars that are self-driving. I think we're going to have the same with trains, uh, airplanes. So more so. Uh, as more and more uh, parts of our lives are going to be automated, we need to, on the one hand, make sure that the software that is um, running out under the hood is correct, okay? And then, this is the second part of, uh, of my opinion, we need to think more about the environmental and societal impact of software, yeah? Because this is something we're only starting to explore now. Uh, you know, this notion of uh, uh, numerical sobriety, so being, uh, you know, respectful of the environment, also thinking about, uh, you know, mental and public health related to uh, the, the software that is employed at scale. And, you know, just thinking about uh, how society, um, you know, like what are the implications for society? of the technology that we're developing, yeah? For example, you know, in cryptocurrency, uh, the idea is very nice, you know, it's good to have uh, such a decentralized uh, uh, monetary system. I think it can be maybe applied to the internet at large, but on the second, like on the other hand, the energy that is consumed to mine these cryptocurrency is enormous, right? So at some point we have to think about the trade-offs and make choices that actually benefit us as a whole. So these are the two aspects, yeah? I think that uh, all the research fields that are uh, in the spotlight right now are actually going to continue to develop. And actually, you know, we're going to find a lot of links between them. But I also think that uh, we have to think more about the impact on society, yeah? yeah. So ethical concerns and so on, yeah. Absolutely, I think that was a great answer and it gave us insight on a lot of things, you know, not mm -hmm. just what the future of computer science will be, but you know, like so many other things that will happen. In the future. That's yeah, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of work on, you know, uh, uh, fighting bias in, in uh, AI tools and, you know, how, how, how can robots make ethical choices? I mean, these are fascinating things that we're just starting to, to, to think about now. And I think that in the future, it will be even more so the case. So it's exciting. And it's an exciting time to get into computer science, yeah? Absolutely. My next question to you is, you're also a permanent researcher at the Samoa Laboratory of Polytech Polytechnic Institute of Paris. So how is that? Mm -hmm. how, is your how is your experience being a permanent researcher there? Yes, yeah, so um, to, to go back to my story about how, uh, how the university system is in France, you know, like we have two things. We have universities on the one hand, uh, where actually students are, uh, you know, like uh, they enter without, uh, pre, uh, without having exams, yeah, admission exams. So we, everybody is, uh, 
taken in and the selection is done uh, throughout the years, right? So these are the universities. And then we have the Grandes Ecole or the engineering schools. So I'm at uh, one of these uh, institutions. And here we have a very selective uh, admission exam in the beginning that actually filters out the, the students. So the level is more is, is a bit more competitive, right? But the downside is that most of the students actually go to industry. So maybe there are fewer students that pursue uh, their PhD studies. So this is one aspect of my job, the teaching aspect. So this is the, you know, like I'm, I'm a teacher researcher. So concerning teaching, this is the, you know, like the, the environment in which I uh, operate. So this engineering school and on the research side, I have to be affiliated to a lab. Yeah. So the lab uh, is, uh, you know, like a mixed uh, institution. We have many teams. Each of the teams is focused on, on different topics. And my team is actually focused on, you know, formal methods, mostly for uh, networks. Yeah, but they're pretty, you know, like open to, to, to other applications. And yes, uh, the experience is also not new to me because even as a PhD student, I was operating within a team, yeah, within a research team. So I, I was able to see what does it mean to be part of a research group? Because a research group is a group of scientists that all pretty much, you know, like work in the same domain. Yeah, maybe they don't work directly with each other, but they have, you know, interactions, daily interactions. When we have coffee breaks, we discuss things, we have common seminars. So I was already uh, exposed to this culture, yeah, of, uh, of being part of a research group. And yeah, now that I'm a permanent researcher, I not, not only get to, um, you know, to, to benefit from that, but I have job stability because it's a, you know, it's a position that um, uh, is not temporary. And I can, you know, for example, uh, uh, propose my own projects, develop my own research projects and try to get funding and hire students to work with me. So now that I'm a permanent researcher, I have this, uh, you know, like independence and liberty to see, okay, what are the topics that are interesting for me and how can I get the means to achieve this, uh, this goal. So I have a lot more independence and also job security. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful, and I think it's great that you do both. You know, like you're not only a teacher, but you're a teacher. that you are able to do both the things, and you know, not just focus on one aspect, but also. Mm. I mean, in France, there are these positions that are a hundred percent research positions. Okay. So it's called the charge de recherche. So these people, they don't have the obligation to teach. They can only do research. And for example, the two institutions where they're hired are either the CNRS, which is the National Research uh, uh, Institute, or the INRIA, which is the Institute for, um, you know, like research in, in computer science as well. Uh, and yes, this was another alternative route. Yeah, not having any teaching, but just doing research. But actually for me, it's good to interact with students because you know I think it depends on your personality. Uh, oftentimes when you just do research, you can get quite frustrated because you know, like uh, research does not happen from one day to the other. Uh, oftentimes the research projects span years. You spend like one year or two years just to get one paper and it has its ups and downs. And I think, you know, being able to engage with students to try to transmit your knowledge is actually good. It puts things in perspective. You know, it makes you think, okay, uh, because, okay, if you're able to explain what you're doing to, to a student and you can get him excited or her, uh, you know, it also helps, um, it helps you, you know, uh, stay focused and uh, motivated as well, because you're thinking that what you're doing is worthwhile. Yeah. So it was a personal choice to do this. And I don't regret it because I love interacting with students. That's amazing. Okay, my next question to you is like more like a follow up since you did talk about, you know, being a PhD student and doing research mm -hmm. and all that. So you also have a PhD in computer science from the Paris Saclay University. How was your experience doing a PhD and would you recommend it to computer science enthusiasts? Yes, yes. Well, what can I say? Uh, you know, a PhD is something hard. <laughs> doing a PhD is hard, yeah? And it's not only hard because you're the only person, okay, it's not only hard because you're, uh, you know, you're, you're tackling an open problem and you're not sure you're going to be able to solve it. It's also psychologically hard, yeah? Because it's like three or four years in which you could have gone to the job market, you could have gotten, you know, like, uh, 
I don't know, a 3K job per month from right off from your master's, but you did not make that choice, right? So you see, for example, are your other colleagues evolving in their lives and you feel a bit stuck because it might not be comfortable to, um, to remain a student, right? So psychologically, it's very important to keep motivation because there are many ups and downs. And I think this was the hardest thing, you know, like the psychological component, not necessarily the work itself, because it feels uh, it feels lonely sometimes, right? And it feels like you won't be able to make it, and you have a lot of uh, thoughts like, uh, is what I'm is what I'm doing worthwhile? The sacrifice? Will I be able to make it? And I think you know from. Um, it, you know, like from a personal point of view, it helps you evolve a lot as an individual and it prepares you to uh, the frustrations of being a scientist. I mean, it's an, it's an awesome job, yeah? But you have to be psychologically prepared to, for example, you know, like uh, not, not, not have results for years. And you have to, you know, I have to stay focused. You have to work a bit every day, not get disappointed, persevere. And these are life lessons that you actually learn for real during your PhD, yeah? So it's excellent preparation to developing grit, yeah, grit. The ability to, uh, okay, when you, when you fail, you just try again. And it doesn't matter that, you know, it doesn't matter. You just try again and you hope for the best. So this is the hardest thing, yeah? But of course, you know, when you do a PhD, you're not actually alone, you have supervisors. So in my case, I had two uh, women supervisors. And I mentioned the fact that they're women because it's actually important. Uh, you know, as everybody knows, women are kind of un underrepresented in, in STEM and not only at the level of the students, but also in among the professors, yeah? So uh, the number of professors is, female professors is quite low. For example, in France, only one in three professors are women when we're at associate level, yeah? And when we go to full professor is actually one in five, yeah? So the, the opportunity to work with two uh, women that were actually that are actually quite strong and uh, you know um, were able to give me good role models in terms of the fact that they both had also families and they both had a very good career and it shows that it's possible that it's doable and it also shows like what what are the qualities that you you need to cultivate to, to get to that point yeah so Yes, I was able to have these great role models and learn these life lessons and also, okay, do a lot of science as well. <laughs> yeah. But I think, I think you have to be prepared for these realities when you start a PhD because many people do a PhD for the wrong reasons. Uh, maybe because it sounds good, maybe because your family wants you to do it, but these are not good reasons, yeah? So you do a PhD only if um, you truly care about science. If you want to, for example, continue in academia, and if you think that you're able to uh, to have this, you know, like to do this marathon, yeah, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. But if you if you don't have these motivations, then I think, okay, it's better to go to industry because in industry, you also can do research and maybe, you know, it's a nine to five job and maybe it's easier, right, for some people to do it. But I think you have to don't, you have to not take the decision lightly, yeah, because it's a lot of, uh, it's a lot of time that you invest, okay? And it might not seem a lot when you're at that point, but you know, in hindsight, it's like a, a, a snowball effect, right? So you need to know when to, when to uh, go away from academia if, you don't, if you're not happy with it, yeah. Right, that makes a lot of sense, absolutely. Mm -hmm. My next question to you is a follow-up of, you know, the fact that you told us only one in three, prof you know, professors in France are women, mm. which is not that. So how do you feel about the underrepresentation of women in STEM? And have you personally ever faced any discrimination due to your gender? Uh, yes, it, it was one in, oh, wait, what was it? Uh, one, in, one in three uh, for um, the hard sciences. Yeah, I think that for... Uh, for humanities, uh, it's better, okay. Um, how do I feel about this uh, situation? I mean, I, I think we're trying to, 
uh, to do the best we can to, to integrate and encourage more women. Like I'm part of a lot of outreach initiatives and, you know, like I, I, I particularly focus on the girls in my class and try to empower them so that they continue, yeah? But it's a very complex uh, problem, yeah? Because for example, in the, in the 70s, I don't know if many people know this, there were actually much more women <laughs> that were doing computer science than men, right? So it was only like in the 80s that this geek culture started. Uh, that was basically teaching little girls that, okay, uh, to, to make it in computer science, you had to be a hacker early on, and you had to be like a geek and a nerd. And, you know, like these, uh, these terms were often very, um, you know, uh, masculine related to, to, to boys and not to girls. And this was kind of, you know, discouraging women from approaching uh, technical topics right from these early years. And it only propagated, right? And the the disparity only increased. And this has been, uh, you know, it has been the case for decades. And only now we're trying to actively address the issue by taking a lot of positive measures and uh, trying to, to encourage uh, girls to, to pursue uh, the, these fields. And I think, okay, the best way to do so is just, you know, do away with the myth that science is only for, for boys, for, for men. Okay, there, I have seen many extraordinary female scientists. And of course, it's a bit harder for us because, you know, we, at some point you need to, you know, like you, you might want to start a family and it's not always obvious how to, you know, how to, um, to combine the two, but it is possible. And I think, okay, uh, you know, like science, like, like they said in the European um, commission campaign, it's a girl thing, right? So all these topics, you know, like, I don't know, robotic is for women, artificial intelligence is for women, you know, like they're, they're excellent female role models in all of these domains. And it's possible, it's doable. So, you know, uh, the, the professors have to encourage women and uh, the entire, you know, like, uh, um, uh, I mean, universities have to have to also, um, you know, like encourage and empower girls. Yeah. And we're trying to do this, but it's a very, very complicated problem. I mean, I'm not sure that I, I can find a solution right away, but you know, like I'm, I'm definitely trying to, you know, talk to women more and to young girls and explain what my job is and uh, what it entails and, uh, and hope that uh, if they want to make the choice, they'll be a bit more empowered that they can do it. Yeah. Absolutely. That was an amazing answer. And I think encouraging women is very important. And even my, like, this will be my last question to you, which means that all the attendees over here, the, you people can start typing in your questions in the chat box. Yeah, yeah. Address yeah, yeah. Questions once ma'am answers this last question. So my last question to you is, do you have any final piece of advice you'd like to give to us budding girls and boys in STEM? Yeah, just to persevere and to have fun, okay? So fun is very important, right? So we need to uh, to see the fun in everything we do to, to, to stay motivated, yeah? And yeah, do not give up. And I think that grit is the most important thing that you need to cultivate because failure will happen at some point. It's better to fail early and, you know, like get used to it and feel comfortable with it because actually as a scientist, you, you deal with failure every day, right? Every day you're in front of a problem. You don't know if you can solve it and you fail a hundred times and maybe, you know, like the 101th time is going to work. So I think, yeah, embrace failure. This is very important and try to persevere because, okay, I was also, you know, when I was in high school, I was the top of my class. I was taking, I was having very good grades, right? And even in my bachelor's, I was among the top students, yeah? But then as things got harder and harder, or maybe I was stepping out of my comfort zone, right? I was sometimes, okay, not the best one in the, in the class, right? But then you have to, you know, like you have to, to understand the situation, adapt to it, uh, be in a competition with yourselves and not with other people and just continue and persevere, right? And then if you find the fun and the joy and the, you, you know, like, you know how to, to stay motivated, then you will never be disappointed, yeah? Because you will do this for yourself and not for other people or for validation from, I don't know, family or friends and so on, yeah? So grit is very important, yeah? 